Hey everybody, I've got a mini lecture here for you today to help you digest some of the bigger ideas and information that Lehrer is giving us in chapter two of the textbook. This week, we're beginning a close examination of the world of Aesop's fables. Our readings will see us travel back to the time of antiquity which is another way of saying the period concerning the ancient Greeks and Romans. This classical period is often considered to be the origin story, so to speak, in the study of Western civilization and literature. I like to start out unit one with the fables because we do move chronologically through the development of children's literature in order to understand the genre and how it builds and shifts through time. So Aesop's fables are one of those bricks in the foundation of children's literature itself. Seth Lair points out that at the time of the fables origins, they weren't designed exclusively for an audience of children. They were part of a wider tradition in oral literature or stories that were performed, recited, and repeated in order to be passed down. So there wasn't much of a sense of these being just for kids, but Lehrer does note that they were considered fundamental to the education of an upper-class child in ancient Greece. Storytelling for the student to memorize and recite tales with a lesson built into them was considered a key element of teaching civic values and rhetoric at the time. I talked a bit earlier in the module about the role of didactic literature that is meant to teach or impart a lesson, and Aesop's fables are certainly a good example of this tradition. The stories are short and to the point. They paint a picture of a moral lesson about how to live and treat other people or move in society. The version of the fables that I uploaded for you to check out this week have an explicit moral statement at the end of each one. And while this is a feature we've mostly come to expect from the fables, Lehrer points out that the moral was originally implied or left for the audience to interpret for themselves. This shift was part of dressing up Aesop's fables to suit the expectations of Christian parables later in history. Now, it's interesting to note that although we attribute this body of writing to Aesop, there's little concrete evidence for him as an individual. Lehrer doesn't really concern himself with uncovering the historical figure, um, and instead he makes it his project to more trace the development and significance of the fables. However, the story goes that Aesop was born in 620 BC, so over 2,500 years ago, and was held in slavery to Greek nobility. He was reportedly a skilled storyteller, and through his wits, gained freedom and changed his fate. Whether he was a real person who made up these stories or not, what's notable is that the figure of Aesop represents how these tales are closely linked to the socially oppressed. Accordingly, the fables often deal with themes of power dynamics and relationships between individuals who have disparate social status or imbalanced levels of power. We see instances where the figure with less power seems to come out on top, sort of underdog stories, usually through harnessing their cleverness or turning the other figure's vices like hubris or vanity against them. Lehrer invokes the Latin phrase ingenium supera viris to describe this value. Cleverness beats force. For all this, though, Lehrer argues that the fables contain a paradox, as he says on page 51. They were, quote, I'm quoting here, a literary form born out of social challenge, yet one designed to constrain resistant behavior and shape children's lives to social norms. So Aesop can elevate the virtue in the serving classes, but we aren't exactly bucking the status quo. 
Throughout the chapter, we see Lehrer apply his interpretation and analysis to a number of individual fables. You'll have the chance in our discussion board thread to choose your own source material from the week's selected fables to carry out your own analysis. To do this, it helps to be aware of the literary technique known as personification, where animal characters stand in for the traits and behavior of humankind. Animal personification is one of those key features of children's literature that sort of marks the genre, so you may be used to interpreting stories in this way already. Remember, a wolf is never just a wolf. So that just about wraps up my snack-sized mini lecture on chapter two for you guys. There's a ton of information beyond this that Lehrer includes in the chapter, but I hope that this kind of helps to give you a, a broad strokes outline to kind of chart some of the major information that he provides.